Welcome back to Podcast 52 of 2021. I'm your host, Kiev O'Neill. You can follow me on Twitter at OBKiev. Follow us to the Ozbreakers and follow us on social media slash the Ozbreakers. This episode is being brought to you by BetUS.ag. For a 100% sign-up bonus, please visit BetUS and use the promo code BETTERODDS. Terms, conditions, and location apply. If you'd like to help us out with our costs and sponsor the website and the podcast, we'd love to help you out. Please visit theodsbreakers.com, click shop, and become a member. Until August 24th, for $24.99 a month, you can get my plays and premium plays before the line moves. Please check out our other cappers as well. They're actually on fire in Major League Baseball, and now football is coming. And if nothing else, please visit theodsbreakers.com and become a free picks newsletter subscriber. My friends, we have a great show for you today because one of the best handicappers in the NFL, college, all football last year is coming on from covers.com, Mr. Lee Sterling. So extremely happy that he's coming on to break down some college football for 2021. We're going to get his ideas on some of the main conferences, the big football conferences, and we're going to get a little information for preseason NFL as well. So very excited to hear from Lee. Before he comes on, I want to quick put a correction in our NFL stats from last podcast. Totally forgot to put in teasers where we were 11 and 6 last year itself in teasers as well as some of the derivative market plays some of the prop betting so we're actually up a couple more percent to 54 up about 60 units so i factored that in to the equation as well i'm actually very excited to get into teasers our refuse to lose teaser that we give you every week was just a fantastic bet and the books are starting to catch up. They're starting to put more juice on a minus 115, minus 120. Just shop around for your best numbers when it comes to teasers coming in to this year. I'd also like to announce that we're going to go on a little bit more video platforms. We're on YouTube, obviously. Didn't do. I've never done a lot of videos, but need to do more. Obviously, with Kyle, we're still going to have better odds every single Friday throughout the whole season, including basketball season, better odds sports betting. But we're going to do a little bit more on Twitch and TikTok and a few other places. Want to start doing a little bit more into the props. The props have been very profitable for us. So expect a prop bet on video. Um, Or if the market doesn't give us one, we won't. We'll just talk about some leans Monday and Thursdays for your night. Thursday night football, Monday night football games, as well as maybe a few for your college football Saturdays if the books give them out, as well as your Sunday NFL football. So make sure you check us out. My friends, before Lee comes on, I'm going to talk about something that's somewhat important. Now, it's more important, obviously, when these games happen in college because scheduling spots are massive. They're massive when it comes to college football because every game's important, right? You can't just lose two games and not miss the playoffs, right? College, you're always trying to win your conference or your playoffs no matter what. Now, if you really stink at the end, that's something different. But every single game is important to these kids, plus they're trying to get into the NFL. That's part one of the biggest things that I absolutely love about college football in general, obviously. But what's important is certain spots. The spots are bigger because emotions come into things. When they beat big teams and big rivals, it just means a heck of a lot more when it comes to college football. And when they have a game on deck, maybe past a smaller game that they could look past, that's something to look for in the scheduling spots. These sandwich games. Now, I don't know if it's going to be a sandwich at all times because we can just project how good these teams are going to be least according to the market, we can use their projection. And then we can try to find some potential sandwich spots uh, throughout the schedule. So maybe you want to get a pen and paper here because I'm going to kind of blow through this and just go through some potential sandwich spots for uh, this college football season for some of the big games. So 
in de- just the definition, the sandwich spot, you have a really tough team, and then you have an easy team, and then you have a really tough team. They could be your rival. They could be just games you've been wanting to win, games you're scared of a little bit. You know, it's the psychiatric of the coaches and the college kids. That's what they are. And the smaller teams might have a little bit of an advantage if you're not really prepping that hard for them. That's what a sandwich spot is. Now, having a sandwich spot on the road <laughs> can be a lot more impactful than having it at home. But I've seen teams still screw up home games that against inferior opponents because they are thinking about the team ahead of them. Now, in general, if there's a bye week in between it, it's not really as much of a sandwich spot unless they're playing a very big rival or a very big name then you can kind of classify. But best rule of thumb, there's no bye weeks, and there is a very small game in the middle, something that they're not going to respect. Now, when it comes to betting these things, remember, it's always price dependent. I've seen spots get overpriced and oversteamed, and it was actually more profitable to go the other way. Always price dependent. And it's not like you have to bet on these sandwich spots. It's either, it makes you lean against betting a good team or maybe a little bit for if the spread somewhat lines up. You know, maybe in your handicapping, some handicappers assign two points to these sandwich spots. And if it's a real big one, maybe even a little bit more, (laughs) you know, especially if it's going through key numbers, you know, think about that. If it's a 10 and a half point spread, their favorites by 10 and a half on the road, and it's a sandwich spot, that's something that might trigger you to buy it because it goes through that 10 key number. So keep that in mind. If you want to learn a little bit more about that, obviously, feel free to listen to more podcasts because that's what we talk about, Uh, some of our great guests, and uh, feel free to tweet us at the Ozbreakers. All right, to start us out, the American Athletic Conference. Unfortunately, not a ton of rivalries in here. There's some really good teams, UCF and Cincinnati. Not a lot of sandwich spots. There's only one with Cincinnati after the Notre Dame game. They have to play Temple six days later, and they have UCF on deck. So I can see that bugging them a little bit. They might be thinking about UCF. Very possible. Unfortunately, UCF's rival is Memphis. Memphis has kind of been down. And then they have Cincinnati and then Memphis. Horrible situation. Because they only have six days rest before they get to Memphis. I find that very interesting here. Maybe Memphis first half. But nothing really sandwiched in that whole uh, situation. Now SMU, they play their rival Houston on October 30th. And then they go to Memphis November 6th. And then they have UCF on deck. So at Memphis is a little bit of a sandwich spot for SMU. Memphis got nothing because they're not playing their rival, and obviously they don't even have to play Cincinnati, which is very nice. They completely avoid Cincinnati and UCF. Very nice for their schedule. I'm not high on Memphis as a team, but their schedule seems pretty easy compared to the rest. I believe that's all we have in the American Athletic Conference to talk about. Unfortunately, UCF and South Florida were rivals, but South Florida has been such a terrible team. Not as much to discuss there. Let's go to the ACC. Clemson. (laughs) Florida State? No. (laughs) They got at Louisville, then Connecticut. (laughs) Florida State was a rival for them, but Florida State has just not been living up. Now, some people think they could be a little sleeper this year, but nothing really there. I mean, they play Georgia their first game. Then they have South Carolina State. Then Georgia Tech. Nobody scares this team. They have zero sandwich spots in the schedule. North Carolina happens to have one right in the beginning because they play at Virginia Tech already an ACC game to start. Then they have Georgia State on September 11th, right? That's the sandwich spot because they have Virginia on deck. So... With them, just having Georgia State in the middle when they're starting the ACC like this is a bit of an annoyance. They do have Notre Dame later, too. That's really interesting. And then Wofford at the very end. I wouldn't call them a sandwich spot because FCS gets crushed. Nothing for Miami or for Wake Forest. 
Virginia Cavaliers has Notre Dame on November 30th. Then they're sandwiched at Pittsburgh because they have Virgin- their rival Virginia Tech at the end. It's rivalry week, right? November 27th. So that at Pittsburgh game might not be something they're going to prepare for as hard if they're more thinking about their rival. Now, obviously, all depends when teams are, if they get completely crushed throughout the season, then all these spots are off the books because they're just trying to win anyway. Florida State, October 9th at North Carolina. <laughs> then they have UMass two weeks later. Kind of funny. They need two weeks to prepare for UMass. What a terrible spot for a pie, but they have Clemson after that. <laughs> so uh, very weird uh, scheduling spot for them. Uh, they're going to get crushed most likely at Clemson. Not even really a sandwich spot there. Just a very weird spot I wanted to point out. Boston College. No, not a sandwich spot because they have Temple. It's too easy at Temple, then Missouri, then Clemson. But Missouri could be a look-ahead spot to Clemson. Maybe they just don't care so much about Missouri. But everyone seems pretty high on Boston College. Louisville, obviously, whenever they play Kentucky at the end, is a look-ahead spot, but Syracuse is before them, so that's not as necessary a sandwich spot, but makes the makes the same type of argument. That's about all we have in the ACC. Going to the Big Ten, Ohio State has the perfect schedule this year. They avoid at Wisconsin. They get Penn State at home, and they have at Michigan and I don't think that they're going to let off the gas if they're undefeated by the time they get to the end of the year at Michigan. So interesting for Ohio State. Um, I know Indiana gave them a run last year, but they're right next to Penn State. Nothing there. Wisconsin, they do have a sandwich spot in the very beginning of the year because they have Penn State September 4th, and then they have to play Eastern Michigan at home, and then they have to play Notre Dame two weeks later. I guess being that it's two weeks is not as much of a sandwich spot, but um, it's still a huge name and a huge game in Soldier Field. So that makes it somewhat of they could look a little bit past Eastern Michigan or maybe just try to protect their players a little bit more in the second half. You never know. I'm not, I'm not going to be like running to the window to lay 35 points against Eastern Michigan with Wisconsin, right? All right, next one is Iowa. And you think this might be a sandwich spot. October 9th, Penn State, October 16th, Purdue, and then October 30th at Wisconsin. But there's a few reasons why it's not. Number one, there's a big bye week in the middle, and that would make that a smaller sandwich spot if they didn't lose their first game of the season at Purdue last year. They lost to Purdue. They lost by one to Northwestern, and then they rolled their schedule, winning their next six games in a row, including Wisconsin. So it's a rivalry. But they're going to try to beat Purdue for beating them last year. Always got to think about that stuff. Indiana at Penn State, it's October 2nd. And then they have a bye week. But are they going to be thinking about Michigan State? Or are they going to be thinking about Ohio State the very next week? <laughs> so yeah, there you go. They could let down a little bit against Michigan State. At least they have the bye week making it less effective. Penn State. At Iowa, October 9th, October 23rd, they get Illinois at home, and then at Ohio State. That Illinois game could be a little bit of a letdown for them. Michigan. Now, this team has a very tough schedule. (laughs) They got at Wisconsin. They got at Nebraska. They have at Penn State, and they have Ohio State. (laughs) <laughs> their schedule. I mean, that's, that's brutal. Unfortunately, brutal. But at the very end of the season, November 13th at Penn State, and then they get Maryland sandwiched before Ohio State. So that's a big sandwich spot for good old Michigan if they're doing good. Now, if they're doing horrible, I wouldn't necessarily fade them. They might just want to beat down Maryland, right? But if they're doing pretty good, that would definitely make a lot more sense. Northwestern, nothing there. Minnesota at Iowa, the 13th, then at Indiana before Wisconsin. They're Wisconsin's arrival for the X, and the at Indiana is a sandwich spot for them. They didn't play Indiana last year. 
Nebraska. They're sandwiched between to southeastern Louisiana. Now, <laughs> I don't think an FCS school could be a sandwich, but it is between Ohio State and at Wisconsin. The spread's like 50. I would maybe look to southeast Louisiana, obviously depending upon where my power rings are and where Sagarin's is. I really like to look at Sagarin's when it comes to FCS. Really good stuff there. Then that's about it. That's about it. Next conference, the Big 12. Oklahoma has the perfect schedule. They might be looking past Baylor to Iowa State, but before that they have Texas Tech. And Kansas State is a revenge spot in the middle of West Virginia and Texas. So uh, that is definitely not a sandwich spot at all. Not a lot in the Big 12 here. You know, just kind of think about look-aheads when Oklahoma's playing Oklahoma State, when Texas is playing Oklahoma, you know, things like that. But I looked at these schedules before I went on the podcast, so I wrote them down what I think. Baylor, between West Virginia and Texas, October 9th, West Virginia, October 16th, they play BYU, and then they have Texas on deck, but they at least get a bye week. So... They might prep for BYU a little bit more and not think as much about Texas, although they are in-state, so somewhat of a rivalry. Just wanted to point that out. I wouldn't call that a big one. Next, Conference. Conference USA. I mean, the problem with Conference USA is that Marshall's schedule is extremely easy, and there's not a ton of big rivalries in this conference either. UAB is relatively new. I mean, they're going to be looking ahead to Marshall when they play Marshall, but we get rice before that, so nothing big there. Everybody and their mom is on Texas San Antonio. So Middle Tennessee is uh, rivaled with Western Kentucky, so they might be looking past Southern Miss on October 30th. So that's a potential one right there. Uh, Western Kentucky will be looking towards Middle Tennessee. So that's obviously the other side of it, right? But they have Charlotte on deck and Charlotte's terrible. So nothing really there. Next one we have, you know, FIU might be looking past central Michigan. It's a Mac game, like the fourth game of the season because they play FAU. So that's kind of an in-state rivalry. So September 25th, even though they they have, uh, they have Texas tech before that, which is tough. They're probably going to lose that. So it makes it less of a, um, big spot, right? Like a big sandwich spot unless you're winning that game. But just think about that as a look-ahead spot. I mean, they might even expect to lose to Texas Tech, right? All right, so let's move along to the next conference, and that is the MAC. Ball State right in the beginning. At Penn State September 11th. At Wyoming is the sandwich spot. And then Toledo at home. Toledo is very good in the conference. They're picked to be a top two top three conference team Wyoming is a distraction and it's really hard to play at Wyoming so I wanted to point that one out Ohio is at Buffalo and you know how good Buffalo's been then they have Kent State October 23rd October 16th Buffalo October 23rd Kent State and then November 2nd is Miami Ohio like an 11 game difference there so somewhat of a bye week but Kent State is kind of the sandwich spot for Ohio. Then you have Central Michigan. Between Toledo and Western Michigan, they have shitty Northern Illinois. And I'm okay with saying shitty Northern Illinois because they're terrible. And they're going to be terrible this year. But Northern Illinois is in the middle of Toledo in Western Michigan. And there's a 10-day rest after the Northern Illinois game. Somewhat of a buy, but still could be a look ahead spot. Maybe maybe it's that one that Northern Illinois actually shows up for. Same deal with Western Michigan. They have Central Michigan November 3rd, then they have Akron November 9th, and then November 16th Eastern Michigan. Somewhat of a rival there. So the Akron would be the sandwich spot, but I would need a hell of a lot of points if I was going to bet on Akron. That's all we have in the MAC. And the really the worst of the worst teams, just remember, they don't really have sandwich spots because they're probably not winning any games. If they win a game, you know, if it's a big upset, yeah, maybe they'll have a letdown spot. But there's nothing really that you can say would be 
a, a bad team sandwiched in between two good teams. The Mountain West. Start with Nevada. They have October 23rd at Fresno State. Then UNLV on October 30th. And then at San Jose State, who they lost to last year. So the UNLV is a is a spot right there to look at. Boise State, unfortunately, has no sandwich spots because their schedule lined up pretty good for them. I mean, Nevada to BYU, BYU is somewhat of a rival with them. So they're not going to look down on BYU to play Air Force. So in general, good news for them. They don't play San Jose State. And kind of the same thing goes for San Jose State. They don't have to play Boise State. So they don't really have anything tough at Nevada has Utah State after it, and then Fresno State. I suppose the Utah State game might be uh, a little bit of a spot. Utah State's a terrible team, so keep that in mind at the very end of the year for San Jose State. Nothing in Fresno. Not a ton of, like I said earlier, rivalries in this conference. New Mexico State's obviously not in it anymore. So, sorry, New Mexico. I'm sure you're extremely hurt about that. I guess Nevada and UNLV somewhat, but UNLV has just been bad. <laughs> you know, I don't see them winning a lot of games this year. All right. Next, we have the Pac-12, and Oregon's got a fantastic schedule. The only sandwich spot they have is at Washington, November 6th. Then they have Washington State which is the sandwich spot, and then at Utah. Utah could be a really tough team. They avoid USC this year. So, you know, think about that. I mean, go Stanford, Cal, at UCLA. So nothing really there. Um, they do have to play Ohio State, but they get Stony Brook and then Arizona. It's not like they're going to be sandwiched <laughs> between any of those teams. Next, we have the Washington Huskies, and they have two spots that's interesting in their schedule they have at michigan on september 11th then arkansas state is the sandwich spot and then cal no bye weeks so september 18th is an early one for you against arkansas state they could let down a little bit if they beat michigan if they lose to michigan you know obviously all bets are off that early especially arizona state later november 13th then they have at colorado you know much should be a much easier team and then washington state they're the Apple Cup, right? So the sandwich is at Colorado at the very end of that schedule. ASU is supposed to be a good team, and that's why I counted that one. ASU has at Utah October 16th, and then they have a bye week into Washington State, and then they have a big game against USC. Everyone guns for USC, so I wanted to mention that. So against Washington State, if they, especially if they beat Utah, is the spot you want to look at, but they would have to beat Utah for me to treat that game like that. USC has two of them at the end. Notre Dame on October 23rd, and then they have Arizona sandwiched in, and then they have at ASU. So you're going to see a lot of these <laughs> Arizona sandwich because Arizona's just that bad of a team. So they might get the benefit if they're the other teams are being overbet. Now, the funny thing right after that is that after ASU, you have at Cal. I'm not sure what USC is going to treat Cal like. Then they have their big UCLA rivalry, the 20th. So November 13th at Cal is a bad spot to bet on the Trojans, possibly bet on Cal if the line tells you to. Utah, all the way to the end of schedule, you have November 5th at Stanford, and then you're at Arizona again on November 13th, and then you have Oregon. So between Stanford and Oregon, you have Arizona right there. Something to think about. Stanford has Utah on November 5th. November 13th, they're sandwiched with at Oregon State. That could be a little tricky. Oregon State's been better. And then they have Cal, their rival. Stanford against Cal, you know, right there in the Bay area. And Notre Dame. <laughs> Unreal. All right. UCLA. On October 30th, they're at Utah. Then they get a bye week, and then they have Colorado, and then at USC. I'm not going to count that. Uh, that's a nice bye week to get to Colorado. They're probably going to prep for Colorado. Um, U U USC is their big rival. Not saying I want to bet on them, but not exactly jumping at that spot. 
Washington, Washington State is the last one at Oregon, November 13th, then Arizona, once again at home, and then at Washington for the Apple Cup right after that. Moving on to the SEC, and unfortunately, my friends, Alabama does not have any bad spots in their schedule because, seriously, do they ever? I mean, does Saban ever <laughs> schedule sandwich spots? Not Really, I mean, his sandwich spot are teams like Mercer, right? I mean, teams like New Mexico State between LSU and Arkansas. So, you know, it, there's nothing really there. And plus, Alabama's just so much better than everybody else. I mean, in general, I mean, it, there's Georgia, but um, there's nothing that really affects them, you know, so that they're that good. Everyone's gunning for them, unfortunately. So Alabama's in good shape. Georgia is also in really good shape, except for one spot. They have October 9th um, at Auburn, and then they're at Kentucky, the second row game in a row, and they have Florida on deck. But at least it's a bye week, so it lessens the blow a little bit at Kentucky. But I wouldn't want to be betting Georgia here at Kentucky with Florida on deck after they take care of Auburn. They, like I said, do get to avoid the uh, Alabama. And Texas A&M for that, right? How lucky. And if you look at Texas A&M's schedule, freaking perfect again. They do not even have to play uh, Florida and Georgia, right? How how perfect did that line up? You know, they get some of the, the awful teams like Vanderbilt, you know, like uh, South Carolina, you know, at Missouri. So... They really lucked out with their schedule and their non-conference. Kent State at Colorado and New Mexico. Freaking cake. So it almost looks like besides uh, Alabama, which is a home game, by the way, their hardest game is at Ole Miss. You know, probably at after Auburn. That's what I would think. So what a fantastic schedule. Holy cow. At LSU, maybe at the end, but I'm not so high on them. Florida. They actually worked out really well. They have a nice bye week between LSU and versus Georgia. And, uh, you know, they're not going to take LSU lightly, right? So they don't have any exact sandwich spots. They do have to play Alabama, um, but then they get their rival Tennessee afterwards too. So that's not a spot. LSU has two of them. October 2nd, they have Auburn. That at Kentucky is a sandwich spot. And then they have Florida. Now, you know that LSU and Florida has been kind of trading blows over the years. They don't like each other at all. So they're probably going to look past Kentucky a little bit to Florida. I think Kentucky might benefit a little bit on some, on a few of these uh, betting spots. So keep that in mind when looking at Kentucky's schedule uh, throughout the year. Next one, we have Auburn, and they have a spot. They go to Penn State, which is a big game, Big Ten game. They want to prove something, right? Then they have Georgia State just sitting there on September 25th, which ain't no... That easy to be a cakewalk. I mean, Georgia State, not a great team, but it's not like they're playing New Mexico or New Mexico State or UMass, right, or Louisiana Monroe. Then they have on October 2nd at LSU. So Auburn, definitely a sandwich spot against Georgia State right there. Interesting spot. Ole Miss, they have a couple of them. They have at Auburn on October 30th. Then November 6th, they have Liberty. And Liberty's a good team. Very good team, right? And then they have, didn't they beat Coastal last year? Yeah, I think they beat Coastal last year. But anyway, then they have Texas A&M. Liberty sandwiched, no buys in between Auburn and Texas A&M for Ole Miss. And then you, after that, you have Vanderbilt after Texas A&M. And then at Mississippi State, the Egg Bowl. Vander, Vandy, as bad as they are. If Vandy hasn't won a game, or even an SEC game by then, they might be live that game. Missouri, November 6th, they have at Georgia. They're going to lose that, but if somehow they play tight or something, they have South Carolina after that. That's the sandwich spot before Florida. And nothing with Mississippi State, really. Nothing with Kentucky or Tennessee, who is completely fucked this year. And I know I don't swear a lot, guys, but let me say the schedule to you. You might swear yourself. They have at Florida this year. 
They have at Alabama this year. They have at Kentucky. They have Georgia. Ole Miss. Holy cow, they got a really tough schedule. <laughs> I mean, the only saving grace is they don't have A&M or Florida, but I think well, I'm pretty high in Ole Miss this year So with Lane Kiffin there. So, yeah, they're, they're pretty much effed. South Carolina, terrible team. Vanderbilt's a terrible team, but what's kind of funny is that Vanderbilt is somewhat of a rival with Tennessee, and then they have Ole Miss in between there. If they happen to somehow beat Kentucky, that would be treated a little bit differently. Let's move on to the last one then, my friends. Sunbelt, Coastal Carolina, the Chanticleers. Remember how great they were last year? Well, they have at Appalachian State October 20th. Then they have Troy just sitting there at home, and then they have at Georgia Southern. Georgia Southern is looked at as a better team than Troy and harder to plan for with the options. So that could be a flat spot, a little bit of a flat sandwich spot in their schedule. Louisiana, Raging Cajuns. And they have at Georgia Southern on September 25th. Then they have at South Alabama, who was bad but now is good. And then they have Appalachian State. And Appalachian State was, you know, before Coastal got big, it was always Louisiana and Appalachian State. Well, um, that South that South Alabama game at South Alabama is what I call a sandwich spot. And Appalachian State at the very end also has one. Um, they have the one at Troy before Georgia Southern. It's a more of a look ahead spot. But if South Alabama ends up good because they have Jake Bentley at quarterback, then I would look at at Troy as a sandwich spot at the very end on November twentieth with App State and Troy Trojans. At Coastal Carolina, October 28th. Then they have South Alabama themselves. And then Louisiana, the projected number one team in the division. So South Alabama on November 6th. No buys in between Coastal and Louisiana. And that's it, my friends. Louisiana Monroe is terrible. And that is your sandwich spots for your college football season. Sorry to bore you to death, but these are important. And even if you don't remember them, I want you to have better awareness for them. Without further ado, let's bring on Lee Sterling from Paramount Sports. Now, I'm very happy to bring back a longtime winner in the sports betting industry. You've heard him many times on the radio, the television, all sorts of media, podcasts, and his great takes throughout the years. I'm very pleased to welcome back Mr. Lee Sterling to the Ozbreakers podcast. You can follow Lee at Paramount Sports and check him out at ParamountSports.com. Man, Lee, football season's coming around, my man. How, are you excited? How, how's everything been treating you? How can you not be excited? Last year was a record year for me. No one hits, you know, 65 70%. We hit 58%, and it's documented. I sold my picks last year for the first time in over a decade on Covers.com. Before that, I'd sold them on Vegas Insider and didn't quite work out for me. Uh, wasn't the perfect mix, but Covers was great, and... Um, my record's verified. You can see I was the number one handicapper combined NFL and college money winner. If you were wagering between $100 and $500, you, you made almost $20,000 on my plays last year, number one combined. And I also put my, my picks up on my website under recent results. So you can see every selection I've had for the last five years. If someone's not transparent, um, you don't want to be with them. And like I said, that is a almost record year. I think that was the second or third best year ever. Out of 28 years. So anyone telling you they're hitting 65 per, or 70 or 80 percent, it's an absolute lie. Absolutely. And make sure you when you check out documented handicappers, check them out on sites that they can't manipulate. You know, there's a, right. lot, a lot of apps out there that people <laughs> will change and you can download right. those apps them yourselves, you know. So yeah. uh, only check them out on those places if you want some of the truth. And uh, the best places have all the plays you can make, prop plays and everything. If they just have limited lines, you can't do derivative markets. Not usually the best place. But Lee, man, it just makes me more proud to bring you on how successful you are. We are definitely top class handicapper show so so excited to get you on this show man and uh yeah. now, now football's here and that's what i've been doing uh you know trying to enjoy my summer a little baseball yeah. here and there and then lots well, of tonight yeah i mean tonight field of dreams yeah. uh yep. yep so that's exciting White Sox. Uh, something different you know we're, we're we're in cities you're in arizona your team is almost like a double a team 
my team's like a triple A team, the Marlins. So <laughs> we've got to have something to look forward to. Yeah, some of the worst. But uh, it's so it's gonna be so cool to see those in the cornfields. So thanks for reminding yeah. me about that. Been slammed otherwise prepping. A lot of people contact you this time of year get it to get on your website and uh, meeting after meeting. But Lee, this is the important stuff because this is what our listeners tune in for. So let's get right into this, man. We're gonna do yeah. this, do a little college football here, kind of. Kind of a high level here. I'm just going to kind of name a conference, uh, Lee, and then you let us know if you like something. You can pass on one or what. We're not one mm-hmm. to go over every single line in every single right. conference or anything like that. There's 130 teams. No reason to do that. But let's st- start away right away with the ever-changing American Athletic Conference. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it starts with the A's. What do you got in this one? Yeah. Well, the favorite is Cincinnati. I think they're going to be really good. You know, they got a returning quarterback in Desmond Ritter. Um, Luke Fickle does a great job. Also special teams. Their special teams are are special. They're generally top 20, top 25 special teams. The better teams will do the small things. So they'll block punts. Um, They're not going to give away points. That's why, you know, they're up at the top. That's why they ended up dethroning Central Florida. So, I mean, Central Florida is really good, and I love their quarterback. Um, and I think actually Gus Malzahn's going to do a better job than what they had there before. I just think they had a drop off. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I, I love uh, Dylan Gabriel. I think he's excellent, but I think they've got some holes there. Not the same there. They had more explosive players. So if you're looking for maybe, you know, a team that might come out of nowhere, maybe SMU or Memphis. Um both teams are explosive. SMU's got a transfer quarterback, Mordecai from Oklahoma. A lot of people don't know about. Mm-hmm. Um, they've got some really good running backs and receivers that are game changers. But uh, Cincinnati's the best team. You know, if you want to, you want to hear, you know, Phil Steele and tell you uh, Ohio State, Alabama, and Clemson will be in the Final Four. <laughs> this is not it. Um, are those good? Like are those good teams, Lee? <laughs> 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 and, and he'll never tell you his record. I mean, Phil does a lot of homework. I, I'm not going to deny that. He's good for filling out like depth charts. But uh, as far as prognosticating, he's not going to make any money. I think he's lost three or four years in a row. Hasn't been pretty. Uh, I, I, you hear about the guys, you know, Phil tries hard, but just can't win. Um, he's at least he's fairly honest. Uh, but I mean, there's guys out there. The new one is Vegas Dave. I don't know if you heard that name. This oh, guy, we don't need. We've spent yeah. way too much time on Vegas. Dave. I, he's claiming now he's like 68 and four on plays. I mean, he can go one and 15 <laughs> and claim it as a winning day. So I'm waiting for him. I think he's the next guy that gets popped and gets 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 locked up. It just he's, he's already been in trouble, him. from what I know. And I know. Oh no, he, yeah, yeah. He's he's beaten. A girl got for an assault charge. He was using fake social security numbers. But I think he's eventually going to get popped and sent away for probably 10, 15 years for just running all these scams and fraud. You can't you can't tell people you went 15 and one when you went one and 15. I mean, over right. and over. And it's it's just not right. And I'm tired of, you know, dealing with, you know, I'll spend a couple minutes if someone's new explaining to them you know, what they can expect, you know, you're not going to make 20 times your money, you know, uh, but, um, you know, just frustrating dealing with the same stuff over and over with some of these guys. There's some people that can win, but those certainly aren't two of them. Oh, for sure. And I I just want to tell you, I like what you said about SMU because I actually took their over six and a half wins here. I mean, I love the non-conference, right? Because you have Abilene Christian, you have North Texas, right? Uh, right. Louisiana Tech's not. Well, I mean, obviously not. You, that. you want to know a team that's underrated? No one talks about is is Tulane. Okay, yeah, yeah. Tulane was. I, mean, I, I keep looking at them. I, I went. I took a shot with them last year. Last year wasn't their year, but I wouldn't be shocked if they snuck up on somebody. Yeah, they blew one game. I'll never forget. I think they were up on Navy, like twenty-one or twenty-four, nothing. Just one of these things where everything it just the snowball. I mean, once things went wrong. It was a snowball effect in that game. You know, they go six to six. Willie Fritz is an excellent coach. Another coach, great special teams. I think he finally found a quarterback in Michael Pratt. He's got some really good running backs. They play good defense. They had almost 40 sacks on the year. Mm. Now, how many teams – the weakness 
of the biggest weakness of the AAC teams on a whole, and then also the teams below it, the, the Sun Belt and Conference USA, is they generally get no pass rush. Right. They just can't find defensive linemen. But they had almost 40 sacks, and that, that tells you something in a total 12-game season. So um, he's very underrated. He won wherever he's been. Yeah, but 100%. That was my other team I was kind of teasing because the prices on Cincinnati, they're not there. And no. the problem with Cincinnati is they return everybody too. And they get the tougher games at home. So I don't know yet about a future, but um, uh, a season win total, certainly looking at them. Let's move on to the next conference then, the, yep. the ACC. I mean, mm -hmm. there's Clemson, just like Mr. Phil, Phil Steele says. And then, <laughs> and one thing I will say about Phil Steele, fantastic magazine. I mean, he does right. a lot of great things. It's just not yeah. all the time it's betting. So we, I want to give yeah. Phil Steele some props here. And I do get his magazine, among others, every single year. But uh, this is a, you know, it's Clemson. And then all of a sudden, there's the public darling, North Carolina. There's the great quarterback at Miami with the recruits that never put it together. And then kind of the rest, man. So uh, do you have anything about talk about in this conference? I think Wake Forest might be a sleeper. Um, they had a lot of uh, COVID cases and injuries last year. They finished the year and they had like half their roster. So I, I think they're a team that returns a lot of guys and, and might be under the radar. I, I mean, no one's beaten Clemson. I mean, I'll tell you flat out, I think Clemson's the best team in the country. Yeah, so maybe. why do I say that? Everyone will tell you Alabama and, and probably Ohio State. So uh, they have a returning quarterback that is under the radar and played a couple games and played great against Notre Dame. He was the number one recruit. They might have had the number one running back coming in, Will Shipley. Uh, so they're not going to miss a beat there. They got three receivers that are 6'3", 6'3", and 6'4". I'm talking about Nagata, uh, Frank Ladson, and Justin Ross. These three guys are 6'3", 6'4", can fly like the wind, and can jump out of the gym to get a ball. They're almost all three unguardable. And they had some injuries last year on defense and return nine guys. I mean, almost everyone, more than any other year, because teams were granted, players were granted another year of eligibility, you're going to see almost every team have 16 to 18 returning starters. But they had injuries on the offense. And guys coming in, I think they're going to fit in seamlessly. So Clemson's my pick to win it all. Well, certainly Clemson. And, I, I mean, minus 600, that's something you don't want to mess with. That's a pretty big stance. And Clemson's schedule is, unfortunately, pretty easy again, man. Well, they, the first game is tough. they got to play Georgia. But um, Kirby Smart, I mean, and I don't think Dabo's great. I just think he knows how to manage his players. For instance, Kirby Smart in the game last year against Alabama. He had the better team. They're up at half. They should have been up double digits. They're only up three or four. I just don't think he knows how to close out games. I just think that teams take the personality of their head coach, and Kirby Smart is not a guy that I want in a real big game. Uh, well, that's fair enough, and uh, I, it doesn't matter with, for the conference to win this game, but I do love it. I think yeah. even the loser of this game is still going to be in it and still in the top five. Right. So remember that. It's not going to hurt them because if it comes down to like a Wisconsin, a Penn State uh, against them um, at the end, and they're going to have that one loss to Ohio State, let's say, in the finals, they're going to pick Clemson that lost to Georgia. You know, that's just the way that, it happened the, early. Right. It happened early. It's the first game of the year. Yeah, you look at the recruits. And, and, and let me say this about Miami. Miami is recruiting better and better. I just don't think Manny Diaz is a great game day coach. He's going to call the defenses this year. He's going back to calling the defenses. Now, people say, well, he was a good defensive coordinator. Miami's played some good teams and stopped some good. That's incorrect. If you look this up, and I think their offense is going to be good. King is a game changer. He turned them in to a competitive team last year. If you have a quarterback, you got a chance, and their offensive line will be better. But their defensive line and linebackers are still not good. They had a guy named Bradley Jennings played middle linebacker number 44. Watch the cutups. Watch any game from last year. The guy's awful. Stinks. <laughs> he played, started 11 games, and he had 39 tackles. At middle linebacker, you could fall down and make 39 tackles. Just just, just lay down and guys will trip over you. Um, North Carolina ran for like 556 yards in that last regular season game against them. They realized how bad he and a couple of the other linebackers were. So Miami's beaten some good teams over the last couple of years. Uh, they beat Notre Dame at home, but 
Notre Dame's offense wasn't good. They have not stopped a good offense in probably 15, 16 years. So they're going to have a lot of guys drafted, defensive backfield, uh, running backs. Uh, King's not going to – he's not an NFL quarterback. But um, Miami – the the Miami game, and, and I want to throw this in there because it, it, it applies to Miami. They have a one-game season. If Miami gets blown out, loses by 30 to 40 games, there won't be 30,000 people at the Miami games the rest of the year. You mean the They'd first game like versus or- the first game versus Bama? Is that what you're yeah. talking about? So, yeah, so they're playing Alabama. And if you watch the Clemson game from last year, a lot of people, they just look at scores and they forget things. I watch over almost every – I watch three games from every team in the offseason. I'll watch their best conference game their worst conference game, and a game that came down to the wire, probably a three- or seven-point game where it was decided in the last couple of minutes because I want to see the key play calls by the offensive and defensive coordinators and how key players play. And against Clemson, I thought that they would have been competitive. The, the play calling was great. It was 0-0. Clemson was driving down the field. On a fourth and four, Miami jumps off sides. Would have stopped them. Mm-hmm. and would have had the ball, and then Miami did it. Clemson ends up scoring. Miami does a double pass. The guy's wide open. He throws it short. Only goes for a 35-yard gain instead of a touchdown. They don't get any points out of it. It started pouring, and they had to change their game plan. I think Miami's going to play to win if they're smart. They're offensive and defensive coordinators. I think they're going to put some pressure on Young, the quarterback for Alabama. I think Alabama's great. They got a lot of young talent. Watch their spring game. But Young can be pressured. And I think Nick Saban knows that. He did not want to start with Miami. Uh, Miami still has athletes. And I think they're going to – Miami's smart. They bring the heat. They don't allow, uh, you know, Alabama to run over like like North Carolina did. I, I like Miami in the 18. If Miami can go into the fourth quarter down 7 to 10 points, I think it's a win for Miami. So I think it's that important for them uh, to, to lose by 17 points or less in that game. So interesting coming into this because you have a new offensive coordinator because Sarkeesian's gone in Alabama and you have a new quarterback because Alabama first halves have been just cashing out like uh, right. like Bitcoin, you know, <laughs> just crazy, right. just crazy. But uh, who? It, this is the, the time where you start questioning it when there's such major changes. Everything's going right. How, I mean, they had back to back great coordinators. They get a coordinator who's now the coach of Mississippi. Um, and great play caller. Sarkeesian, great play caller, had some substance abuse problem, drinking too much uh, alcohol problem. And I don't think O'Brien's right for the college game. Bill so, Bill O'Brien is – I couldn't stand him when he right. was – and he did Belichick a favor probably because they were, right. he was under Belichick, you know, they're friends. Yeah. So <laughs> – I don't know. I'm scared. You know, I mean, this might be no, like, no duh that it's all Nick Saban anyway. They start blowing it, but I'm not. I'm not willing to just bet on Bill O'Brien yet. We'll we'll see yeah. what we'll see what happens. Oh, great stuff. Let's move on to another conference then, yeah. with the limited time we have. Uh, okay, Big Ten, right? Big Ten. My Badgers are in it as usual. Second best favorite, but I sure as hell wouldn't lay, lay or give plus six hundred to win the conference. That's horrible number. I don't, these these future numbers have been awful. Just to let you know, you're laying. We my, don't have to play it. If, the but, key is I don't play many future college numbers to win conferences. I, I'll take a flyer on a couple teams. If you don't like it, the key is don't bet it. Yeah, there's not much to bet because this year yeah. they, they're all massive holds well, for these it, books. I don't know if you know this about NFL win totals. If you add up every NFL win total, they're higher. It's six more wins mm-hmm. than are games played. So they know that the public plays overs. So if you don't like something, I play a lot more unders and overs generally than NFL win totals. I mean, they're setting you up. They you know, and then they add the juice. So you know, so I, I I give out a couple to my clients. But if you're looking for five or ten. In the NFL and college football, I just don't have it. All right, I agree. Well, let's start. Let's get into the Big Ten then a little bit. Obviously, big yep. transition with Ohio State with the quarterback gone and a couple other players, Browning and uh, you know the, the running back uh, Sermon. 
and yep. obviously Fields. But I, I, I took Michigan under seven and a half with plus money. I'm, I, I don't every year I don't take their under, and Harbaugh right. is just stink, and I keep wondering why. And this is one yeah. I haven't given out to odds breakers uh, yet or anybody on a podcast. But you know, here's the thing: I also took Penn State under nine, but they play each other, and I think the winner of this. It still can go under nine, and the losers probably go under nine. I mean, you're looking at Michigan, brand new team again. They never return production. They are Washington. They're at Wisconsin this year. They are at Michigan State, which is kind of their rival in a way. At Penn mm-hmm. State, Ohio State should be on the road because they're going to lose it anyway. I mean, there's what right. four, four or five losses just right there, and that and then that means they have to beat. How about, how about Maryland? They can play Maryland. Maryland could be tough this year. You want to. It, it, Indiana, it, Indiana earlier. could be better, and Indiana was good last oh, year. I think, yeah, I think Indiana's going to be really good. People forget Indiana was right there with Ohio State. Indiana only lost by a touchdown that game, and later they lose their star quarterback. So I don't have any real strong opinion on those totals, but I do like Indiana. I think Indiana is going to be a really strong team. I, 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 I think Penn State. You might be selling them a little short. Well, so, Penn State, if they do beat Wisconsin, that first game at Wisconsin, right. Bucky's usually yeah. good the first game they prep for a while. Then I'm going to be a little bit more worried about that, but then I'll be a little bit more happy about the Michigan one, right? But here's the thing. Right. They're at Ohio State. They're at Wisconsin, like I said, and they're at Iowa. And I actually have Iowa slightly power rated a little bit higher than Wisconsin. So if, if those three losses happen, you're pushing. And so they just right. got to beat Indiana. They got to beat uh, Nebraska. A couple, a couple other tough ones. Oh, they got Auburn this year, which is yeah. not a give me, but they should win it. But it's not a give me. And then at Maryland, Rutgers at Michigan State. It, yeah, it, they, when was the last time Penn State got ten wins? Right, forever. And it's been a while. They yeah. could be at nine. So yeah, I think Auburn's going to be pretty tough. I mean, hey, Auburn recruits some pretty darn good players. Trust oh, me. Yeah. It, may, it may not be Alabama. And and Nix has not been great, but he hasn't been horrible. They haven't given him a whole lot of talent around him to set him up to be successful. So well, that first year he started, he was young, and like the whole team was young, right? Like he, like all the good guys were drafted that year from Auburn, the defensive tackles, you know, and, and then yeah. um, you know, so now he's kind of growing with this team a little bit. And they could be a little bit better this year than last year's. And so who knows what Penn State's going to be. Penn State was one of those teams that the year before they were getting all the lucky wins. And last year they got uh, the, the unluck. So nine's still high for me. Uh, any other thoughts in the Big Ten? I like Indiana. Okay. Uh, I think Maryland might be good. Maryland always has injuries early in the year. Team to look at early. I mean, how did how are they getting these players? I, are, are they are they paying him? Who would want to come to Maryland? I, I don't get it. Uh, Loxley must be a good recruiter. I think he's an awful coach. Remember, he, he coached at New Mexico. I think he was like 2-30, and 30, something like that. Two wins and 30 losses, then punch one of his coaches and gets fired. I remember. He rehabs. Another coach rehabs at, at Alabama, and then he gets his – yeah, he's recruiting, but I, I don't get it. I mean, what, there's a lot of kids that are picking Maryland over Penn State, Michigan, so – Wow. I don't think he's much of a coach, but you look at you look at the the kids and where they're rated and who they had to choose from. He's done an impressive job. And then a uh, team I like is Nebraska. I'm not saying they're going to win nine, ten games, but you know Martinez, if if he doesn't have, you know, he had someone just looking over his shoulder the whole last couple of years, and they brought in a couple of recruits, not game changers at receiver and running back, but I, I think that they can consistently move the ball. Uh, big defensive line. I like their linebackers. They make plays in space. So I think Nebraska is probably the most improved team in the conference. I wanted to be – this was the year I circled to be high on Nebraska. But after the COVID season last year, things got screwed up. They still have to go to Wisconsin. And they still have that Ohio State on their schedule. It, it drives me nuts. So, They've been playing Ohio State like every single year of right, Scott Frost's right. tenure, man. They cannot get a break. I, I think his first. I think his first year everyone thought – I think the line was like – 17 or 18 at home and it was like 31 nothing middle oh, second man. quarter and everyone turned the game off so mm-hmm. um i'm not saying he's a great coach but i think he's bringing in some solid talent and i think they'll be improved there well he was great at ucf if you remember yeah, with I agree. with mckenzie milton so yeah. let, let's move on to the next conference then yeah. so you kind of like the overs on those season win totals i'm guessing are the three that you mentioned let's move on to 
is it Big Twelve? Big Twelve is next. The conference right. that's still barely the Big Twelve, <laughs> but right. as far as this year is concerned, they are the Big Twelve. So let's uh, take a look at it. Uh, I mean, this conference has a giant like Oklahoma, and mm-hmm. after they beat up Florida, who is missing players? They're extremely hyped this year. Right? Are they a little overhyped? I don't know. But uh, then, then obviously, the public darling is Iowa State. Who I was on last year, and I hedged out of that game. Thank God, I made money on since I was able to get like plus like twelve to one on Iowa State. We hedged the other side, and that was fun. But I'm not sure if I'm doing it this year because you're not getting any value. What are your thoughts on the Big Twelve? So, if Matt Campbell's smart, he gets out after this year. I think he has a chance to win 10, 11 games. He's got some. How do you become, go from a good team to a great team? He's got a quarterback in Purdy who didn't play that well last year. I um, think he had like 18 touchdowns and eight interceptions. It wasn't that impressive. I think he underperformed. He's got a great running back in Brees Hall. I think he'll be a late first, early second round pick. Got a tight end in Kohler, who's great. It's like six, 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 seven, almost unguardable. A couple offensive linemen. He's got Rose, a middle linebacker on a D, B, and L. He's got five, six guys that might go in the top two, three rounds. So, he might recruit well, but after this year, it's going to be over. So I think he's got to go for it. I don't think Texas is back. A lot of people like Texas. I, I don't think they're back. I think it's going to take them a couple years. Uh, they don't have the depth. TCU isn't there. Um, Mike Gundy, his offensive coordinator, since they made a change a couple years ago, not the same. They don't have that explosiveness there. And I don't like Casey Dunn, their offensive coordinator. So that's one of the things. West Virginia, looking for a sleeper. Um, another team returned 17 guys, established quarterback, running back. Uh, got a couple guys on the offensive and defensive line who young, I think, that are that are improving. I watched 88 so far spring games, and their spring game impressed me. I think, you know, they get into big games, and a lot of times they just don't have the talent to play with in Oklahoma. But uh, I'm not saying they're going to win the conference, but you're looking for a team that that might take to the next level. They were six and four last year. I think West Virginia and Neil Brown, who did great things at, at Troy in his third year. Third year is usually when when things start to fall into place. All right. So West Virginia is. Yeah, I mean, it, I like Neil Brown, man. I like Neil Brown. I, it's just that their schedule didn't look too easy. We're not, we're, we're not playing them. We're not playing them to win the conference. You know, we're playing them. You know. To win more games and to, and to cover more games than than most of the teams. No, that, and that's fair. Thank you. Like sometimes you like something like you say, I'm gonna like this team ATS this year, and that's kind of a great point. You know, it's not like the team that's down. The team that's down is Kansas State. I thought they in the third year of Chris Klein, I thought they'd be making the next step. I don't see it. I don't see the talent there. Um, they just don't have any game breakers at wide receiver, running back. Um, their top two sackers from last year left, so. It's an interesting conference. A lot of teams are going to take shots at Oklahoma and Texas for leaving. Mm -hmm. Texas may not be as excited a couple years from now when they get in the SEC and they start going six and six (laughs) and they realize they could should have stayed probably in the big 12. I think they're making a mistake. I, now, do I think the SEC could be wonderful to watch every week? I mean, I wanted Miami to go there. I'm from Miami. I, I said, when they went to the ACC, go to the SEC, listen to these, and I'm, I'm hearing from a pretty good source what these four different quads are going to be. They're going to have uh, Texas, OU, Arkansas, and Missouri. They're going to have Texas A&M, LSU, and the two Mississippi schools. Got All these conferences got two really good football schools, a pretty good school, and then maybe an also-ran, but a lot of great rivalries. Then you've got Alabama. Auburn, Tennessee, and Vanderbilt. Got to like that. And then the final one is Florida, Georgia, South Carolina. Who am I leaving out? Tennessee. Always that big rivalry, Florida and Tennessee. So each team I'm hearing will play, you'll play each team in your division once, and then you'll play two of the four teams in the other three divisions of the SEC. So at least if you're a fan of an SEC team, you're going to play every team every other year, and you'll play have a home game against every team every four years. 
Yeah, so. yeah, that's it. That's interesting how they're going to block the, do that and it, like a round type of robin when they play, you know, the conferences, right? The other conferences. Yeah. It, it's crazy to me how the other ones are going to survive. But that's that's just that's a completely different subject. Right. We yeah, could me and you, right. me and you can talk about that forever right. if we decide to go into that topic. I agree with your Kansas State assessment because I heard someone like the over. Uh, they're five and a half wins. But there's first of all their first game versus Stanford. That's not a give me. Stanford's no. going to be ready. Uh, the Southern Illinois is a win. But then Nevada was one of the best teams in right. the Mountain West. And then um, there there's one later, I believe. Where, where are the wins going to come? Yeah, I know because you're at Oklahoma State. You have Oklahoma at home, which is worse because that's you're that's giving a up loss. a home game to lose. Then you have Iowa State at home, which is bad because that's another yeah. uh, home game to lose. At Texas Tech, who knows? TCU at home, who knows? At Kansas is their th- third win, I'll just say. And then West Virginia, maybe three and a half. Baylor, four and a half. At Texas, maybe. You know, so I- I'm kind of leaning towards the under with Kansas State, and I do like Kleiman. I just don't think it's his time yet. When when t- right. when when coaches come from FCS schools into a completely different area of the United States. The, believe it or not, no none of the high schools are pushing for them to recruit their kids to those schools. He's kind of oh, unknown. I know that. And, and 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 what happens is they start recruiting, and they're like, "Oh, this guy's better than one we had at FCS." Yeah, they're better, but still not in, good enough to beat uh, an Oklahoma, a Texas, you know, an Iowa State. Right. Exactly. And I can see. Texas starting off slow again, just becoming Texas, you know? And so I agree. Everything you they said. They don't have the depth. Listen, sometimes you get nothing at a press conference from coaches. I heard Steve Sarkeesian interviewed, and they asked him, what's the difference between Alabama and Texas? And he said, we got some good frontline players. He goes, we're looking to build the depth. So what he's telling you, if you read between the lines, they don't have any depth. They get any injuries, um, they're in real trouble. Oh, no, totally agree, 100%. We're kind of going a little slow on time, so why don't you just stick to the big yeah. conferences here, okay. skip the MAC, skip okay. Conference USA. Let, let's right. let's go right to the Pac-12 there, and yeah. this is interesting to me because the Pac-12 South, I feel, is pretty loaded with not elite teams, but mm-hmm. good ish great ish teams like like yeah. uh arizona state's supposed to be great this year utah is utah right they're coming back and then no no but listen 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 what's going on with utah charlie brewer transferred the average person's gonna think oh it's utah their offense hasn't been good their defense is usually good in special teams charlie brewer watch the spring game he goes 15 for 15 oh yeah he picked up the system charlie brewer i'm telling you i'm almost sure was hurt last year and played, you can put money on it. I think he played hurt, and he left. Why did he leave? I think he had some big problems with the offensive coordinator. Offensive coordinator got fired after one year. What does that tell you? So um, they got some guys that can play. They also got one of the key running backs from Oklahoma. Um, He should be able to do some damage there. Got a couple young receivers. So Utah might actually have an offense. Uh, USC is USC. They're loaded. You know, this Helton can't screw it up. And and Herm Edwards, I, he's got talent. I mean, he, he returns 20 out of 22 starters. And uh, they did, you know, they switched to a pro-style offense last year. I think with them only playing four games, the development of Jaden Daniels hurt a little bit. So I think he'll – He'll be much more better, but uh, they need more. The key is got to get more pressure on the quarterback. That's the key. Um, they had it last year, and they need to keep those sacks up. Uh, you get those plays for losses. Um, they could have, they blew both games that they lost. They went two and two. They were up on USC, I think, by two touchdowns. They lose 28-27 and, and, and then lost to UCLA, but blew out Arizona and, and Oregon State. Those three teams, I mean, that's going to be a dogfight. You're right. Those are three really good teams. And even UCLA. That's what I was going to say. I, I, I was going to say UCLA. I, was, I made a lot of money on UCLA last year, and they returned Robinson and everything. So it's those four teams are just super good. Now the problem right. is, um, are you going to pick one to win a South? You almost sold me on Utah because when Brewer played against Oklahoma, and I believe that was the Kyle, Kyler Murray year, he stuck with right. that team, a bunch of under recruited guys at Baylor. Yeah. What right after the scandals happened, Matt Rules, one of I think maybe his last year there, mm-hmm. did that good at Baylor. I, I am 
I would not be shocked for them to win at USC and possibly take that mm-hmm. division. So I'm going to be looking a little bit more into the Pac-12 here. Well, let's move on to the SEC then, man, the big <laughs> one that everyone's talking yep. about. So obviously, just like you kind of teased earlier, uh, Bama yep. returns really you know, not a ton of production, but they're a reload team. But Bryce is their quarterback over there, Bryce Young, and everybody's ranting and raving about the spring game. And I never look I, – I like watching the spring games. I don't look too much into them. But, uh, you know, losing Sark is just interesting because I that offense that they were running made anybody look good. And I'm wondering, does, does, does Saban retain a lot of that stuff? Was it all Saban? Does it flow into their new offensive coordinator, man? I'll let you get started. So I think Young's going to be good. I think it's going to take time. Just watch him. I like, you know, playing college quarterback. I'm, I think I'm pretty good studying quarterbacks. I think he's going to be good. But when he doesn't see his first receiver right away, he starts scrambling. And Mac Jones would go one, two, three. He'd pick up being in the system and playing in games. You can't do anything. You can't buy experience. And I think that hurts him. Now, they got a lot of – Real good running backs. You know, they lose Harris, who's amazing. Three really good receivers. But they got some real good young receivers. The guy to watch is they're going to use um, this kid named Keelan Robinson. So he didn't play in the spring game, number two. They're going to use him at slot back, running back, receiver. He's kind of uh, a guy that can do everything. So he's he might be the next, you know, slash, they call, out there. So their defense is going to be really good. I mean, they came on last year as the season wore on, and they got accustomed to each other. Start didn't start well against Mississippi, but um, I think the time to catch him is that first game. And with O'Brien, you know, coaching his first college game uh, back as offensive coordinator, they might get him. A and M is interesting. So I think A and M talent wise is the closest team to to Alabama. So they got a quarterback battle going here. And a lot of people think that they're going to go um, uh, with, I think it's Zach uh, Calzada. They think they're going with him. If I'm right, and if I'm Jimbo Fisher, I go with Hayes King. Hayes King is more mobile. How do you beat Alabama? you got to have a dual-threat quarterback. And Hayes King is a, uh, a freshman that I think that can – he may not be quite as good a passer as Calzada right now, but I think he's a much better runner. Listen to their schedule. They start off with Kent State at home, win. Colorado will be a win. New Mexico, blowout. Then they play Arkansas. They'll beat them. Mississippi State, they should beat them at home. And then they got Alabama. So it builds up. I think it works out perfectly for them. If Calzada is the quarterback and they play Alabama, I don't think they'll win. Because I think they can game plan for him. But with King, remember Johnny Football, what he did to him, uh, they could be scary good. They got Anias Smith, at receiver, slot back, who's amazing. Isaiah Spiller, these two guys are going to be first, second round picks. They are that good. And they got some guys on the defensive line that are next level guys. He's been recruiting. So AM's a team. I, I, I don't think LSU's there. Ole Miss will be fun. You know, they throw the ball around, still no defense. I think Auburn's going to be improved. So, uh, no, I I love the fact that they have two easy games because they return only one yeah. offensive starter for the line on yeah. O line. But you know, after all these years, no, Jim- Auburn, no, Auburn returns, Auburn returns four. Or oh, five. oh, I'm sorry, Auburn returns. I, I was thinking you're still talking about A and M there. Okay. No, no, no. but what no, is- A&M only has one returning starters. But teams like that, like A&M and Alabama, they've been recruiting so well. It, the schedule sets up perfectly for them to get experience. Well, what, but, I uh, like, yeah, Auburn return- what I like yeah. about the Aggies is that they avoid Georgia and Florida from the other side, yeah. right? I think that's huge because this team was playing Clemson, I mean, for their non-conference yeah. the last couple of years, and they'd always get yeah. stuck with the Georgia and Florida, right? Well, now, yeah. now this year, it's Kent State at Colorado and New Mexico, man. And then you're right. It, right. That, that builds momentum because they're winning by 30 points. They destroy Arkansas that has no defense. They, they, they blitz Mississippi State at home, and then they get Alabama at home. What a better setup th- than Texas it, A&M for And if they win this. that game, if they win that game, they got South Carolina at home after that. 
uh, Missouri at Missouri, big deal. Uh, Auburn at home at Mississippi. I mean, LSU, at LSU last game could be tough if they're not injured, but I think the schedule sets up perfect for A&M. I think this is the year that Alabama loses a couple games. All right. Well, I love it, man. I'll put that right out there. Because I want change. Dang it. I want change. I want to see someone else. Right. <laughs> who, hey, who does it? May it? Not be, it may not be two years in a row, but I think they're going to lose two games this year. All right. No, that, other side. Other side. I'm going to give you a quarterback I think that's going to be an absolute disaster. Emory Jones for Florida. I don't think he's a passer. Pop in the tape of him playing last year. He's mobile, but just not a passer. Okay. I, I, I I think you're going to end up seeing a freshman quarterback take over there by midseason. So, well, well, Mullins likes that dink and dunk stuff a lot, you know. With the yeah, but still, but still, he's he's not accurate. He's not a passer. Yeah, they lost so much at Florida. It, it, I'm worried about Florida, man. Well, they got some. Okay, so they got Jacob Copeland coming back. They have another kid, Xavier Henderson. Remember, his brother played defensive back, cornerback. First round pick by Jacksonville two years ago. I saw the kid. I go to some of these high school games. I finish my shows at 7, 730 on a Friday. Let me tell you about this kid, Xavier Henderson. In the state title game that they won, come from behind, caught like nine balls for almost 200 yards. As a ninth grader, ninth grader, he ran with his brother and two other high-level guys, went to Division One. Oh, he went Josh Job for – Alabama, the cornerback, and someone else who went, I think, another Division One school. He was the anchor on the four by one hundred meter relay team that set a state record. Wow, six four. He is an absolute stud. He's he's like those kids at at Clemson. So you're looking for a guy that that comes out of nowhere. It'll be Xavier Henderson. Problem is, I just don't think that uh, Emory Jones is the guy. So I don't think you can get him the ball enough. Henderson is, plays wide out, right? Maybe they'll throw him in yeah. the slot a little yeah. bit. Well, I mean that's some yeah. good that's some good positive news. But um, yeah, Emory Jones might they might switch out a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of positions for Florida here. Oh, they're going to run the ball a lot more. They're going to run the ball, but losing don't, don't losing Pitts and Tony, losing stars like Pitts and Tony in the first round. Oh, those guys, guys were those guys Jesus were phenomenal. The, those two guys were unguardable, yeah. unguardable. Right, right. And Kyle Trask had a great you know camaraderie with all those guys so yeah 100 percent. and i and i agree yeah. with you on lsu I I, I, just, I I i like ed orgeron as a head coach but i only like him when he's got elite uh coordinators right and he lost his guy you know he lost yeah. Bra- joe brady and joe brady was the guy that brought all the rpos to joe burrow there right so and so much that team was amazing you or i could have coached that team i don't think ed orgeron's a good coach i think he was saved by he just happened to he, he struck lightning in a bottle with the, the head coach uh, getting a coordinator like Brady and the talent that he had. I mean, Joe Burrow, the year before, when he came from Ohio, it was terrible. Mm-hmm. Wasn't any good at all. Yeah. Came out of nowhere. Yeah. Everything clicked. And how good was Trask last year? He threw 43 touchdowns, just eight interceptions. Mm-hmm. If, if Jones throws 25 touchdowns and has – 10 interceptions, I would I would qualify that as a good year. I don't think he's going to do even that. Well, funny you mention that. How bad a luck was it for Trask to have, you know, guys like Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields and right. those guys in his draft class right. when right. he should be the one starting this year for oh, you and, know, and the Jets? Knows, Jets any, other, any, other, any other year, he probably goes 15-20 in the draft. Yeah, top fifteen, easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Maybe even better. But yeah, that was yeah. that was bad luck for him. Well, good stuff, man. We're already yeah. into forty minutes, so I have to ask you: Have you made any plays yet for college football week one, or any games of the year, or is there any free plays you want to give out to anybody listening or watching this video? There's obviously a few yeah. lines out week zero. Um, yeah. We can go over those lines if you want, real quick. Okay, so so um, give me the lines week zero. There's like three games. All right, let me pull them up real quick. Week zero, and I already looked at these, of course, and I got something brewing. It's just not there yet. It's derivative, wink, wink. Maybe if uh, you guys tune in for the next couple pods in the derivative markets, I'll, you'll get something from me. But right now you got Nebraska laying road chalk to Illinois at minus seven with a total of 54.5. UConn. 
that didn't even play last year's road, road dogs to Fresno State, 27 and a half points, total of 62 and a half. And UTEP is at New Mexico State. UTEP's laying nine and a half road chalk. Total is 56 and a half. So I like Nebraska. I think Illinois is going to be awful early. Uh, they had a couple key guys, like receiver and tight end, transfer out, and um, takes a new coaching staff. Just getting on the sidelines and calling plays. That's why uh, the NFL last year was important. Uh, some of these young quarterbacks struggled because they didn't have preseason. You know, mm-hmm. quarterback like Tua, he would have really benefited last year by by preseason having a normal camp. But um, I, I think that Nebraska takes it to them there. I like uh, UTEP. A lot there. I think UTEP. I think Mexico State is awful. They're they're an independent now. They're not in a conference. They're my worst power rated team. Yeah, they they, they didn't they didn't play last year. They played I think a spring season against like two Division two schools, and both Division two schools went up and down the field on them. Anyone who was anyone left that that team, and UTEP was actually pretty good. Um, they couldn't you know play with teams like Texas, but. Um, I think they'll score enough. They're not a big score, but they should win that game like 38 to 7, something like that, 38 13. So I like I like that there. A week two play to look out for. I don't I wouldn't take UCLA and lay the wood against Hawaii. UCLA as a home favorite has been horrific. I think like something like 17 and 24 the last decade, and Chip Kelly's not good as a home favorite. But I want them to just win the game uh, when it's something like 35, 24, something like that to Hawaii. But that extra game experience and then play at home against LSU, it might be a three, four point underdog. That that might be a spot there to take UCLA. You, uh, I think LSU is going to have trouble with mobile quarterbacks. Look it up. They didn't face many mobile quarterbacks. A mobile quarterback, I think, will really give them trouble. All right. Well, great stuff. Thank you for that. Make sure you guys check out those plays and the, those leans for week two coming in. A little tease there with the LSU UCLA game. How about the NFL, man? Preseason's upon yeah. us. There's games tonight, games Friday, games Saturday. I think it's that time. Yeah, a couple I like. I like uh, New England tonight a little bit. Got a quarterback battle going there. I don't think Cam Newton is going to hand the keys to Mac Jones. And they had a lot of guys last year out with COVID and injuries. They're really deep. So I like them there over the Washington football. Well, team. hopefully, hopefully, because this pod's coming out tomorrow. So uh, we'll see if we're, yeah. <laughs> we'll see. Yeah, right there. There. Uh, here's one for, for Saturday. Like uh, I like Miami getting three, three and a half at the, at the bears. Look at the bears starting three receivers. I think they're worth three or four in the league. The next 10 receivers on the roster, I, I barely even heard of. They got absolutely no time. You haven't heard UCLA. about Wims? You haven't heard about uh, Riley Ridley? Yeah, right. right. <laughs> Riley, I've heard of him because he's from down here yeah, right. in South Florida. But other than that, I hadn't heard of any of the other guys. You see a lot of 17-13 scores in preseason, 17-16. You don't see a whole lot of long drives. So it's usually a defensive back making a mistake, falling down, going up, trying to go for an interception. And Miami's really deep. Almost every position now built built some real real good depth and Fitzmagic, you know, uh, you know he moved on, but uh, they're playing the Bears and I think Justin Fields is going to be great, but maybe not playing a half here in his first game. So uh, and I'm hearing Bears are not going to play their starters much at all, and they, they don't want to take a chance anyone who's even close to not 100. percent So I think Miami's going to play uh, their starters and their backups a little bit longer than Chicago and. Getting three, three and a half. A lot of games, remember, um, almost no – I haven't seen a game in over a decade go to overtime. So They don't now. Ex- Preseason games ex- are not allowed to go to overtime. Oh, is that their new rule? Yeah, that's what – yep, to? that's the yeah. new rule, yep. Yeah, so they go So they go for they go for two if they score a touchdown. And so getting three, three and a half, um, that's a big number. You can lose a game by one or two points and still win the game. Funny you said that because I was talking about that on our Monday show slash Tuesday morning that comes out. I'm like, how are the how is Matt Nagy, who's 0-3 week one in the preseason, a three-point favorite here 
when his defense is all guys that are not going to play because they're older guys are already set in their positions. Yeah. They're just going to be trying out a bunch of people. How is that even possible? <laughs> it made me scratch my head, man. So I'm a complete- and another one. Green Bay. Green Bay's only three. I know, you know, Rogers isn't going to play in the game, but love hearing good things about him. The best, the, the third string running back for Green Bay is better than probably the, the, the Texan starter at running back. So, Watson's not going to play. Come on. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they're not going to play Ingram at, in Houston. That's for no. sure. And so, it, well, here's the funny thing about that. After all the crap that Love got this year, don't yeah. you think he's going to have a little chip on his shoulder? <laughs> and and they, they don't have, they yeah, they have a great receiver, but the next seven or eight receivers are like all the same. They're like interchangeable. Yeah. Totally. So I think he's going to make some things happen. He's got a chip on his shoulder. They got depth running back. I mean, Defensive line, second, they've been building that depth. It's the reason they went to the championship game. They had a better cornerback. They beat Tampa Bay. Yeah. So um, they were right there. Oh, well, look at that, man. So we yeah. like the, it looks like the Packers and the Dolphins here, my man. Well, have, where can our listeners find your great information in place so they can also be $20,000 up, like shown at covers.com? Just go to paramountsports.com. Uh, we actually won hockey there. It was our first year back in hockey in over a decade. We won hockey. We're number six right now in baseball with a with a bullet. Um, since they had to, you know, they, these guys can't doctor the ball anymore. That we've been studying the spin rates, and there's some pitchers that are having big time problems. So that's helped us, and we're on a roll there. The last two months, I think we're like 70, 48, and one in baseball, uh, winning almost fifteen thousand dollars last two months. So coming out of a hole and in the plus there, and. Um, like I said, number one, and I don't, I don't think anyone's record, documented record, can match up to mine. So just go to ParamountSports.com. All the specials are up and available. Or if you want to speak to me personally, now's the time. In the next week, uh, I'll speak to you personally. 800-400-9741. Check out Lee Sterling. Lee, thank you so much for taking the time coming on. I'm excited for some football, man. Enjoy the rest of your week. All right, take care. Make sure you guys check out Lee at ParamountSports.com. Now it's time to give you a free college football play for week 1B. A lot of people say that's week 1 and the other week is week 0. But that makes absolutely no sense to me. Because how can you have a week that doesn't exist? There's week 1A and week 1B. If you want to complain to me about that, feel free to tweet us at the Oz Breakers. Here we go. We're going to Texas, my friends, where Texas is a nine and a half point home favorite versus Louisiana Lafayette. They don't even like to be called Lafayette anymore. They like to be called Louisiana, but everyone still calls them Lafayette for some reason. Anyways, this is a pretty large spread for a new Texas team with a brand new coach in Steve Sarkeesian. And a brand new quarterback because, as we all know, Sam Ellinger has left the building. Texas Longhorns, last year, not that great. Lost to TCU. They at least went to Oklahoma with four overtimes. Lost to Iowa State. But then, you know, destroyed Kansas State and Colorado. The problem is they don't return a ton of of production. As a matter of fact, new quarterback Casey Thompson is going to be thrown in and high, with high expectations to uh, lead this Texas team through a tough Big 12 schedule. Now, we obviously don't care about the Big 12 schedule. We care about this game. But we also care about what they lost and what they have to replace. You know, their best offensive lineman was drafted in Samuel Cosme in the second round. Uh, linebacker Joseph Osai in the third round, Taquan Graham, a defensive tackle in the fifth round, Caden Stearns, a defensive back, and obviously their leader, who feels like they he must be like 24 years old or something. He's been there forever. Sam Ellinger, drafted by Indianapolis. So a lot of changes for Texas. A couple new receivers will be coming in the fold as well. 
The good news is they do retain their top receiver in Joshua Moore and their best running back, who was a freshman in Bijan Robinson. But still, they, they have to learn a completely new scheme with Sarkeesian, and there's going to be some headaches with that. So looking at Louisiana, this is the top team in returning production. They return everybody, right? Everybody. Louisiana is poised to take the Sun Belt. As a matter of fact, in most sports books, they are favored to win the Sun Belt. Levi Lewis is back at quarterback. Errol Rogers Jr. Jr. back at wide receiver. Jalen Williams back at receiver. Peter LeBlanc back at receiver. They return their full offensive line. Their running back, Chris Smith, rushed for 684 yards last year. Okay. That's the really only guy they lost was Elijah Mitchell and Trey Regis. And, man, it's just stacked. Look at their defense here. They only lost one starting linebacker in a safety. They return everybody. If you remember, their first game last year was against a tougher team and at Iowa State. They won that game 31-14. to Now, was the score a little misleading? Yes. But that doesn't mean that they don't know how to beat these big teams in prep for them at the beginning of the season. And they're sitting here at nine and a half point dogs. Same coach and Billy Napier. Love his record, 28 and 11 at Louisiana. Take the Raging Cajuns plus nine and a half. They had 10 wins last year and played a full schedule. My friends, if you have any questions about the odds breakers or you'd like to contribute please tweet us at the oddsbreakers or visit us at the oddsbreakers.com. If you'd like to, us to break down a game for you, I'm more than happy to do that on the next podcast. Have a great rest of your week. Enjoy all the NFL preseason games and go get some winners.